so this week, Hannah Burson is speaking, um, and she was talking about mock data functions, false data functions, and weighted odd errors diagrams. Thanks for the introduction, Ian, and the invitation, and thanks for organizing this seminar. I've really been enjoying the talks every week. Um, it's not normal that you basically have a like conference on your topic going throughout the semester. Um, so I'm going to start with some quick background just to remind everyone that a partition of an integer n is a way of writing n as a sum of positive integers. To make this a little bit more interesting, I'll use the seven partition five as my example instead of the five partitions of four. Um, so they are all listed here and we can confirm that there are seven of them. And then I will be using um, Q series notation in my talk. So these are those or the Q shifted factorials. So the subscript is how many terms are in the product and the Q is kind of how much each term grows by if you haven't seen this before. And that's really all you need for the combinatorial aspect of it, um, which is mostly what my talk is on. So in my research, I work with two modular diagrams which are like Ferrer's diagrams, which are a standard um, graphical representation of partitions. But um, with the two modular diagrams, you basically, every time you have two boxes next to each other, you smush them together and replace it with a two. Any part that, any odd part that can be written as 2k plus one would be a one followed by k2s, and then the even part would just be the k2s. So here are two examples with both odd and even parts in the partition. I work, um, what I'm talking about today is odd Ferrer's diagrams, which are an analog of partitions that have a nice graphical representation. So you can take an ordinary Ferrer's diagram, so a top left justified array of boxes, so Ferrer's diagram or Young diagram, you put a zero in the top left corner, fill the rest of the perimeter, which is the top row and leftmost column with ones, and then fill the remainder of the diagram with twos. And we call this an odd Ferrer's diagram. It's sometimes helpful to think of this, not graphically, as an ordered pair where you have a non-negative integer and a partition into odd parts of size less than or equal to 2k plus one. Um, and then we can say that the size of our odd Ferrer's diagram is the sum of all the numbers in the cells, or you can think of it as our non-negative integer k plus the partition, the partition into odd parts. Um, some history on odd Ferrer's diagrams and work that was done previously, they were introduced by George Andrews. Um, Originally in 2007, um, and then, but then mostly um, in more recently when he was talking about some combinatorial interpretations of uh, mock theta functions. Um, and so uh, Andrews introduced the generating function. So the more straightforward generating function for odd Ferrer's diagrams is this Q series where the numerator q to the n makes the row of n ones in top preceded by a zero. And then the q q squared sub n plus one in the denominator generates partitions into odd parts of size less than or equal to two n plus one. And we can draw those as a two modular diagram and then it fits very nicely below the n ones in the numerator so that our general shape is that of a Ferris diagram. However, this series can be rewritten in a similar way to the Durfee square generating function for ordinary partitions, where our numerator is 2n squared plus q to the 2n squared plus 2n, and that generates an n by n box of twos, and then the perimeter with a zero in the corner, ones on top and ones to the left. And then the denominator is 2 um, factors that both give uh, partition into odd parts of size less than or equal to 2n plus 1. And one of those partitions, you can interpret the parts as columns that we place to the right of our square. And then the other partition you can place normally as rows, all two modular though, 
below the square. So these two series are the same. And if you know your Mach theta functions, this is Watson's third order Mach theta function omega of Q. So for a brief historical interlude, um, we learned a little bit of this, I think, last week, but Mach theta functions were first mentioned in 1920 in Ramanujan's final letter to Hardy. Um, and they look like theta functions, but they're not equal to one exactly. Um, and Ramanujan was able to formalize that a little bit and Watson formalized it more, but there wasn't actually a formal definition until 2002. So over 80 years after Ramanujan originally introduced Mach theta functions, when Zweigers was able to formally define Mach theta functions as the holomorphic part of harmonic mass forms, which means that you can take a Mach theta function and you can add some non-holomorphic integral to it, and then you get a function that is no longer holomorphic, but it transforms like a modular form. So these functions are very interesting also from the analytical interpretation. Uh, to, uh, one other thing that odd Ferris diagrams can do is you can, since they're the shape of a general Ferris diagram, you can conjugate them in the same way you'd conjugate a Ferris diagram. So you take any row and you now change that to a column, or you can think of it as reflecting the diagram across the line y equals negative x. Since we can conjugate them, it's interesting to talk about self-conjugate odd Ferris diagrams. And these also have a nice generating function. So this generating function that comes from a pretty similar interpretation to the second generating function for odd Ferris diagrams, um, except now our denominator, instead of separately being two different partitions into odd parts, you have to have the same partition into odd parts twice. And then one goes below the square and one goes to the right of the square. Um, this, if you know your mock theta functions, is nu of negative q squared, where nu is another third in the same family as omega, also due to Watson. So um, these odd Ferris diagrams were originally interesting because of the way that they provided nice, uh, straightforward combinatorial interpretations of these coefficients. What I'm interested in is what happens if we look at Q series that count the, where the coefficients count odd Ferris diagrams with some sort of weight attached. So first I'm interested in what if we compare our odd Ferris diagrams with an even number of parts as those with an odd number of parts. When I talk about number of parts, I'm talking about for the odd Ferris diagram, the number of rows not including the top row or when you think of it as the ordered pair notation, it's the number of parts in that partition into odd parts. Um, the generating function for counting with this weight is the generating function for odd Ferris diagrams, except that in the denominator, we replace the Q with minus Q so that each appearance of a part contributes a factor of negative one when we expand out this product. Then um, I'm going to give a short historical interlude about why these sorts of series could be interesting. So a uh, pretty uh, elementary or uh, one of the earliest identities in Q series is this theorem of Euler, where the infinite product of one minus Q to the J it, um, is equal to this bilateral sum, which is a theta function. And this uh, theorem of Euler is called Euler's pentagonal number theorem because these numbers that show up in the power of Q on the right-hand side are the generalized pentagonal numbers. And there's a nice combinatorial interpretation that um, this theorem gives, which is that the number of partitions of N uh, into a di distinct or into an even number of distinct parts is almost always equal to the number of partitions of n into an odd number of distinct parts. And the only time they're not equal is when your n is one of these generalized pentagonal numbers. Um, this theorem ends up coming up in lots of different places, and it has a really nice um, combinatorial proof called Franklin's involution that Franklin um, figured out. 
Um, and what's exciting about this first weight is that we get a not quite as nice, but a similar sort of um, simplification in some sense of our generating function so that we have this series where most of our coefficients are zero, um, except for a few that are one or negative one. So we can give a combinatorial interpretation of this Q series theorem that um, tells us that the number of odd Ferrers diagrams with an even number of parts is almost always equal to those with an odd number of parts except for when n is of the form 6k squared plus or minus 4k. Now I said that the um, pentagonal number theorem has a really nice combinatorial proof with an involution. Um, this theorem does not yet, um, so it is an open problem to find an involution to prove this identity. Um, and I've spent a little bit of time thinking about it, um, but I have not been successful and I'm not working on it anymore if anyone wants to work on it. Um, and, um, but I can share a few thoughts. So these numbers, the 6k squared plus or minus 4k are two times what are called the generalized octagonal numbers. And thinking of it this way can kind of help us guess that when we finish our involution, the leftover diagrams are going to follow this sort of pattern. So how I get from one diagram to the next is that I either add two more columns and keep the number of rows the same, or if I've just added two more columns, then I add one more column and one more row. Um, and that ends up getting following this pattern of 6k squared plus or minus 4k. Um, so uh, I would guess, um, and partially from something you'll see later in some bijections or some involutions I have been able to find, um, I uh, have pretty good evidence to guess that this is what would be left over, um, but I don't have great ideas of what the involution would be that would fix these diagrams. Um, next, I'm going to talk about an overpartition analog of odd Ferrers diagrams. And so we can remember that I'm talking about kind of weighted counts of odd Ferrers diagrams. Um, and an overpartition is a way of um, combinatorially explaining a weighted count without saying weights of integer partitions. So an overpartition is an integer partition in which the first appearance of a part of any size may be overlined. You can also refer to it as the last appearance of a part of any size, as long as you just fix which part you're saying you're either overlining or not. It's the same. Um, and so I'm interested in what happens in our odd Ferrers diagram if we allow our partition to be an over partition. So we can for, uh, so as an example, I um, have shown a picture of what I want to happen with an over partition. Since um, odd Ferris diagrams are such a nice graphical representation, I want my over partition analog to also be nice graphically. So what I've decided to do is show any part that would be overlined by adding a shaded square at the end of that row. Now, this requires us, if we want our diagram to still be in the general shape of an odd Ferrers diagram, or of a Ferrers diagram, we need to add an extra restriction. Um, this extra restriction is that only parts of size less than or equal to 2k minus 1 may be overlined. This extra restriction is required so that we don't have a shaded box like shooting off the end of our diagram so that our rows are still in weekly decreasing order. And then when we, um, with looking at this over partition analog, we have a generating function by taking the generating function for odd Ferrers diagrams and then in the numerator putting a generating function for partitions into odd distinct parts, and that will generate the parts that are overlined, but we have restricted our product to be one fewer term because of this extra restriction that only parts of size less than or equal to 2k minus 1 may be overlined. We call these diagrams shaded odd Ferrers diagrams, and in a similar way to how you can think of an odd Ferrers diagram as an ordered pair of a non-negative integer and a partition, 
you can think of this as an ordered pair of a non-negative integer and an over partition. If you really know your mock theta functions, you might have recognized that generating function as the second order mock theta function B of Q. So this is one of the mock theta functions that's been discovered post Zweger's thesis um, when the field was kind of reinvigorated. Um, and it was studied in a 2008 paper by Richard McIntosh um, as part of a family or a couple families of second order mock theta functions. Um, and there, and the most common definition for this theta function is this series on the left hand side, but the one that's obviously related or most clearly related to odd Ferrer's diagrams or shaded odd Ferrer's diagrams is the right hand side. Um, so using our shaded odd Ferrer's diagrams, we can give a combinatorial interpretation of this identity. Um, and we can say that the number of shaded odd Ferrer's diagrams of size n is equal to a specific um, uh, a specific subset of two colored partitions where we have a lot of restrictions on the even parts that appear. Uh, something else that's important about this is this um, the fact that this generating function is b of q also adds to the motivation for adding this restriction on what size our overlined parts or shaded parts can be in our um, shaded odd Ferrer's diagram. So it's both that uh, graphically it looks nice that we put these shaded boxes at the end and it still is the shape of a Ferrer's diagram. Um, and then also in terms of the generating function, it's a series that we actually care about. For this theorem, I do have a bijective proof um, and I'm going to sketch it here because it's a little bit technical and I won't go into all the details. So, um, so here I have a two color partition. I have the added restriction that all even parts are uh, only the first color, which in this case is orange. And any even number smaller than the largest part has to appear once and it can appear at most twice. So what happens is the first appearance of all even parts turns into this triangular shaded odd Ferrer's diagram. So each even part contributes one less as a row, and then it contributes a one to the top row, and then we shade every square at the end. Then what we can do is we can add, is we can insert our um, odd parts that are orange in as columns, as two modular columns. So the 13 becomes six twos topped by a one and so on. And we insert those as columns. And then the part I'm gonna hand wave is we have to do something with the second appearance of any even part. We will also insert this as two modular columns, but we don't necessarily justify this at the top. We have to uh, do a calculation to figure out exactly which row we start our column in. And then wherever we've started it, we remove the shaded box from that row. Finally, we insert any remaining uh, partition, any re remaining odd parts, which are now all going to be blue in as rows, and those aren't shaded. What is interesting to me about this bijection is that it allows us to keep is that by keeping track of certain um, statistics throughout the bijection, we can give a refinement of our theorem. So if we keep track of the number of even parts appearing exactly once in our two colored partitions, then our, in our diagrams, we have the number of shaded boxes. And so this is why it was useful to remove one shaded box. Also, it makes it so that you can actually have a bijection, but um, it, this was one of the hints that I was going to need to do that, um, was that I needed the shaded boxes to correspond to the number of even parts appearing exactly once. Um, and then the number of distinct even parts uh, added to the number of odd parts of color one ends up being the top row because each of our first appearance of even parts uh, contributes one to the top row and then each odd part of color one adds a column. And then similarly, if we add to the distinct even parts, the odd parts of color two, we get the number of parts. So we have a nice uh, four variable 
refinement of our theorem. And what's cool to me about this four variable refinement is, well, there are two things. So first off, um, it gets us a lot closer to a general hypergeometric series identity um, that, could, that does not have a direct combinatorial proof. Um, and so this could, um, so I have a few details in my paper of what the combinatorial interpretation of that should be. And it's still an open question to give that combinatorial proof. And then what I wanna focus on here is that we can look at special cases of this refinement. So the first special case is that if we set Z to be Q and T and W to both be one, we get uh, A of Q, which is another second order Mach theta function. It's in the same family as B of Q. Um, and so now we have these two uh, Mach theta functions that are related to each other analytically, and we can relate them to each other combinatorially. Um, by tracing, it's essentially the same bijection. To prove them, you just have to think a little bit more about what this uh, extra factor of Q does. We also get some extra special cases that require a little bit more analytic work. So if we take the limit as Z goes to zero, then we get a uh, trivariate extension of the third order Mach theta function omega um, and combinatorially, this makes a lot of sense because taking, since Z in the right-hand side was counting the number of shaded boxes in our shaded odd Ferris diagram, setting the number of shaded boxes to zero gives you an ordinary odd Ferris diagram. Um, and this is a known three variable extension of omega and it's been studied a lot in the last five years or so um, as people, there's a like third, um, there's a third way of writing omega that's a little bit harder to actually get from these and people are still looking for a trivariate um, analog of these two identity or of these two series for that version. Um, another bonus special case is that if we let z go to zero still, but now instead of t and w being one, we set them to negative q, and then we do a little bit of Q series work, we end up with one of Ramanujan's original third order Mach theta functions, F of Q. This one's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, I like it whenever F of Q comes up. It's kind of the prototypical example of a Mach theta function. It's one of the first ones. Um, it's related to ranks of partitions, which are interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, and then what I also like about this related to the ranks is that the, the normal definition of F of Q is this series on the left-hand side. And, um, and what happens is that in the denominator, you contribute negative one for uh, parts or for parts and for largest part um, other than the like square. And so it helps you get the difference between the largest part and the number of parts or the rank. Um, if you trace through the bijection, you can actually give an argument for why the right-hand side also generates ordinary partitions um, counted by the difference, or ordinary partitions weighted by the ranks of the partitions. Um, and so it gives a kind of not direct, but interesting um, proof of this identity to trace those through and show that they actually count the same thing. Next, I'm going to kind of combine the two weights that I've already talked about by looking at shaded odd Ferris diagrams counted based on the parity of the number of parts or with a weight negative one to the number of parts. Um, so here I can introduce functions that um, count the number of shaded odd Ferris diagrams into an even number of parts of size n and those into an odd number of parts. And similarly to my first generating function for ordinary um, odd Ferris diagrams, the generating function looks pretty similar except for two Qs are replaced with minus Qs so that we are contributing a factor of negative one for every part. What this um, generating function is actually the thing that motivated me originally to look at shaded odd Ferris diagrams because it appears in Ramanujan's lost notebook. 
So this identity is one of six identities where on one side we have a series where the power where the non-zero coefficients occur when the power of q is some like some multiple of triangular numbers so the triangular numbers are n times n plus one over two um, so this is four times triangular numbers so then with our reading the left hand side as the generating function for the difference uh, in uh, shaded odd Ferrers diagrams into an even number of parts and shaded odd Ferrers diagrams into an odd number of parts, um, we can give a nice combinatorial identity of this partition, or of this, of a nice combinatorial interpretation of this identity. Um, the, uh, this also should remind us back to Euler's pentagonal number theorem of it's a similar sort of thing that on the right hand side, we have one of these series where most of the coefficients are zero and some are one and negative one. And on the left hand side, we have a series where it is not obvious that that is the case. Um, and, and our combinatorial identity is, between, is about the when the number of some sort of object into even parts, even number of parts is equal to those into an odd number of parts. Uh, one thing that's different here is this series on the right hand side is not a theta function. It's what we call a false theta function or it can also be called a partial theta function. The reason it can be called a partial theta function is that if this series were bilateral, so n started, we started our counting from negative infinity to infinity instead of at zero, it would be a theta function. Also, for it being a false theta function, if we removed this negative one to the n in all the terms, we'd have a, we'd have a real theta function. So false theta functions, um, which are a broader category than partial theta functions, um, are, um, they don't have a like super great analytic definition like mock theta functions do, but they, um, but they are functions that like look like they would be theta functions, except that you've changed the signs of an infinite number of terms and you've made it some in some way that you can't just sum theta functions together to get it. This identity I do have a proof of and it's somewhat similar to the proof of to Franklin's involution to prove the pentagonal number theorem. Um, so we can start with we can remember that we could conjugate ordinary odd Ferris diagrams. We can also conjugate shaded odd Ferris diagrams the exact same way. We just now have some shaded boxes that stay in. So we read our uh, row, original rows become our columns and our original columns become our rows. Now, um, if the length of the top row and the number of parts of our partition have different parity, then conjugation is going to be sign reversing. It's going to change the parity of the number of parts. So it's going to change the sign of negative one to the number of parts. Thus, we really only need to figure out what's going on when we can't, when conjugation isn't sign reversing. So when the number of parts in our partition has the same parity as the number of ones in the top row. So to talk about that, I'm going to introduce a couple statistics that we'll need to pay attention to. So the first one is the length of our over partition is the number of parts in our over partition. And we can remember that in terms of the odd Ferrers diagram, it's the number of rows not including the top row. Or you could think of it as the number of rows that start with a one. We can also define L sub R of our odd Ferrers diagram and that is the number of boxes in the last column. So it's not the size of the last column, but just the number of boxes. So here it would be two in this example. And then L sub S is the number of boxes in the last row. Um, and both for L sub R and for L sub S, we don't count shaded boxes. We're just counting the number of boxes containing a number. So in this case, our L sub S would be one. And the reason we choose not to count shaded boxes is just that it makes defining the involution easier. So now we can consider a couple different cases depending on the relative sizes of L sub R and L sub S. Uh, 
and this is how we can solve our problem for when our number of ones in our top row, which we've defined to be k, is equal to the length of our partition, or our over partition, or not equal to, but equivalent mod 2. Um, so first, if our rightmost column has fewer boxes than our uh, shortest row, we can fix the rightmost column and conjugate the remainder of the diagram. Since we originally had the number, uh, the top row and the first column having the same parity, this will change it so that they have different parity. Um, and you can convince yourself of that if you want to. Um, and then similarly, if our smallest row or our last row is no bigger than our last column, then we can do the same thing where we fix the last row and uh, conjugate the remainder of the diagram to end up with a sign reversing map. Now this doesn't totally solve our problem because there are a couple cases that are going to give us problems. First, if we consider this diagram, we have that our shortest row or our last row is smaller than our last column. So we can fix the last row and conjugate the remainder of the diagram and we'll get this nice symmetric uh, odd Ferris diagram or I mean it's a shaded odd Ferris diagram with no shaded boxes. Uh, at the same time, if we consider the conjugate of our original partition or our original odd Ferris diagram, we have that our rightmost column is shorter than our final row. And so we fix our rightmost column and conjugate, but oops, we've now gotten the exact same diagram. So this is not going to be a one to one map, which is a problem. So we have to figure out how to fix this. Uh, in luckily, we end up having problems where we also can't define where one of these um, shaded odd Ferris diagrams should go. So if we consider a shaded odd Ferris diagram with a similar sh or with the same shape to what our output was for both of those cases of the map in the last slide, but we include both possible shaded squares here. If we try to uh, follow what our original rule was, which is that if the final um, column or the final row is equal to the final column, we fix it and conjugate, we have a problem because with an over partition, we're only allowed to have one part of every size be overlined and it has to be the first part. Or with a shaded odd Ferris diagram, we can't have two shaded boxes right on top of each other. So this is a problem. So it can't be equal to that. Uh, if we try to map it by fixing the rightmost column, we get a similar problem that we have two shaded boxes right next to each other um, horizontally, and that's a problem. So we now don't know where we would map this square. So we can fix this by considering all four shaded odd Ferris diagrams with the same general shape of the odd Ferris diagram, but there are four different possible shadings. For, and then for the first two, it, uh, based on whether the bottom part or the bottom row is shaded, we map either by fixing the bottom part and conjugating or removing the shaded box and fixing the rightmost part and conjugating or thinking of it as the conjugate of what happened uh, when we didn't have the bottom uh, square shaded. And then similarly with these two over here on the right, uh, they both get mapped to conjugates, but this time we have shading. Um, and so this will actually work for every one of those types of hard cases. Um, and, um, and these hard cases kind of occur when, if you think of it from this top side, it's when our rightmost column and our bottom row are equal in size and the bottom part only appears once. Um, or it could happen when the smallest part is smaller than the rightmost column, but appears multiple times is when those problems will happen. So I just dropped my charger. Um, okay, 
So then what we're left with, this is an involution, which means there are going to be some fixed points. And that's what we want to consider for what will become the right hand side of our identity. So the leftovers are diagrams where our number of parts in our over partition are is equal to the number of ones in our top row. Um, and where the uh, length of our rightmost column and the length of our bottom row is k plus one. This ends up being that we have a square. So these are exactly the cases that are left over because if we tried to fix, if we conjugate it, it's not going to be sign reversing. Um, it's, we're going to get the identical thing back. Um, and then if we tried to do one of these where we fix either the bottom row or the rightmost column, it wouldn't be a well-defined map because we no longer have a, a diagram that is in the general shape of a Ferrer's diagram. So here's just one example. Um, and then, but you could have this example with any size square. So now that I've finished uh, talking through that involution, we also have a refinement here where we can let Z count the number of ones in the diagram. And as is the case usually with the, at least the first variable you're adding to a refinement, um, I knew that this identity was true when I was originally starting to figure out the involution and it helped me realize that we needed, that the number of ones in our diagram was gonna be fixed. Um, and it's important to remember that because in a little bit, we're gonna look at some examples where we know that's not the case and that's why those examples are still open problems. So, so now we can consider kind of other weights or we can think of it as other variations on odd Ferris diagrams. So one of the ways I define an odd Ferris diagram is not graphically. Um, it's this looking at an ordered pair of a non-negative integer and a ordinary partition or a over partition for shaded odd Ferris diagrams. And so what if we generalize this a little bit to allow our partition to have any size parts that are less than or equal to 2k plus one. So now we'd still have that the two modular diagram for our partition fits below a row with a zero and ones um, and still gives us a Ferris diagram or Young diagram shape, but we now aren't guaranteed to have ones in the leftmost column. Now, Graphically, this seems a lot less interesting because we don't have the nice symmetry, but it is, uh, there is motivation to look at this. Um, so what I have here is six identities that are found in Ramanujan's Lost Notebook that are their false theta function identities, and all of them on the right-hand side, the powers of Q with non-zero coefficients are some multiple of the triangular numbers. Um, you might notice it all the uh, small number multiples except for five between one and six and it's uh, would it's an open problem to find more of these or prove that these are the only ones um, it's usually easier to find identities than to prove that identities do not exist however uh, so it would be really nice to have combinatorial proofs or at least interpretations that kind of relate these identities to each other because looking at the right hand side and even for all of them except the first one looking at the left hand side they look like they should be somewhat related um, however the analytic proofs of them vary greatly and vary greatly in difficulty some are just like straight up applications of um, the rogers fine identity um, and some require like several Q series transformations. Um, and so the, so one of the motivations with looking at this broader um, set of pairs is to try to prove the rest of these. I have ideas and they're stated in my paper on this for um, what is gonna happen in the proof of this middle one where we have three times triangular numbers. Um, but I don't even have much in the way of ideas for the other one, um, other than a proof, like ideas towards a proof of the first one that would be like very different from the proof of the rest of them. So this is still an open problem um, uh, that would be really interesting for someone to be able to prove the rest of these. So this fourth one is the one that I've proved. Um, and then being able to prove the rest of them and relate them to each other um, would be really valuable.
Um, now that I've given some motivation for looking at these other pairs, they also show, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I do want to talk about what makes them hard. So what happens to our odd Ferrers diagram if we allow parts with an even size is that we no longer have a column of ones here to the left. Um, and so that means that we can't do conjugation. Um, and then another thing that um, gets difficult is that if we try to add in a second variable to keep track of the number of ones in our diagrams, um, experimentally, it's gonna sh it shows that the number of ones can't stay fixed. So when we add in that second variable into the side that's clearly the generating function for these objects, it doesn't end up showing up nicely on the other side. Um, so that suggests that the number of ones isn't going to stay fixed, which means that any sort of map that we would do would have to break twos apart or combine ones together to make twos. Uh, now I can also talk, now that I've talked about that motivation for looking at these, we can consider weights besides the ones that show up in Ramanujan's false theta function identities. Um, and so like in this first uh, series here, we have pairs where we have a non-negative integer and then just a partition whose two modular diagram would fit below that, um, either with twos or ones. And this ends up being a ratio of theta functions. Um, all three of these end up being ratios of theta functions. Um, the second one would be adding, allowing um, part sizes to be overlined. So um, this first one is kind of the closest analog to odd Ferrer's diagrams, removing the restriction of the left-hand column needing to be ones. Um, and then the second one is kind of the closest um, uh, loosened restrictions for shaded odd Ferrer's diagrams. So we have this distinct parts generating function in the numerator for shaded um, boxes or, sh or rows with shaded boxes. Um, and then the third one um, has even more restrictions that we would require any of our rows with shaded boxes to be odd. So um, it does appear that these like, it could give some nice combinatorial interpretations for these identities involving ratios of theta functions. And these would also all be open to prove combinatorially, or at least combinatorially this way. Um, and these uh, functions on the right hand side are all theta functions using uh, Ramanujan's definition of a theta function as f of a and b. Thank you all for coming to my talk. And here I have the um, citations for both papers that I talked about. The second one um, is, I can't actually remember if it's on the archive, but it is linked on my website um, if you're interested in reading it since it's not published yet. Great, let's all thank Hannah for her talk. Um, and then I guess let's open up the floor. Does anyone have uh, any questions? I guess I have, I have a quick um, back. So you had a couple refinement theorems <clears throat> and one even like uh, three or four variables. Um, and so part of the initial motivation was that these functions were mock theta functions or false theta mm -hmm. functions that had some sort of modularity property that we understood. So do you, yeah. have you looked at or do you, do we know uh, modularity properties of, you know, maybe not this four variable one, but maybe just like uh, one of the refinements with two variables. Is it uh, like a maybe form or, or have I, I haven't actually looked at it. Um, I probably, it would actually be a good exercise for me to do it to get more comfortable with that side of mock theta functions. I do know that the three, or I'm like almost positive that the three variable extension of omega doesn't have mock modular properties. Um, in the other variable, but I know that there are some, I've had a conversation with Amanda Folsom about this recently. I know that there are some extensions that do, but I don't think that one does. Um, and so that kind of suggests that definitely not all of these would. 
um, it does get you close to this ends up be this like theorem um, to prove it with Q series techniques. It's the like, I guess I'm already using T. Oh, shoot, I was supposed to remove these A's and I didn't. Um, there is a like fifth variable you can put in, but it's not actually interesting combinatorially because it's just T times C or T times W. Um, but the, um, the um, yeah, if you, you can keep, you can count them as like, I don't know, R, it's the like R to the zero coefficient of a hyper of a like generalized hypergeometric series identity, um, uh, but that definitely doesn't have mock modularity properties at that point. Got it. Okay. I guess you would be able to numerically, if you have something that you suspect could be a mock modular form, or have any similar type of modularity properties, you can tell numerically because you can look at the asymptotic expansion near cusps. And okay. if, yeah. it, if it were a mod, that's how Ramanujan found his first mm -hmm. examples, essentially, right? Uh, yeah. if you, look at, you look near a root of unity, say you look near one, then you let Q equals E to the minus T. So if you take log of your function at Q to the, at Q equals E to the minus mm -hmm. T, um, if it's modular, it would grow like, that would be like epsilon to the minus K plus little o of epsilon to the n for all n. If it's mm -hmm. mod modular, it's like the same, but with an extra constant term. But, you know, a generic yeah. QIP geometric thing will have an infinite expansion, and a mock modular or modular thing will have a finite expansion. So you can numerically actually find those first few coefficients at some cusp, and you can tell. So like Ramanujan would have known, Zagi had told me this once, that, you know, this isn't what he says in the letters, but he's, he would have known, for example, that f of q is almost modular, but he wouldn't have known, he would have known that it's not quite mock modular. So if you look at like, yeah. um, if you look at Q equals one, you can't tell if F of Q is modular or mock modular. But then if you look at minus one, which I guess he did talk about in the letter, you can tell it's not. But anyway, you would be able to like, yeah. it would probably, even if it were like sort of close to modular or mock modular, you would probably notice it from these asymptotics that it's special. If on the other hand, you compute it and it, the expansion looks like some numbers that never stop, then it probably has no modularity. Okay. But yeah, that's a good question, Ian. Yeah, it is a good question. Great. Do we have any other uh, questions or comments? I guess I know Ola Varnar has written down a lot of identities of partial theta functions that, I don't know, could be related to things. He yeah, he has. Um, and then part this actually Ian told me a year ago, and I've done the reading, but partial theta functions are now getting to be slightly more interesting because they're related to uh, quantum modular forms, or they're like, they have quantum modular properties. Well, even better than that, we've known that they had quantum modular properties for a long, for a while now. Um, but we know that we know how to, what their modular properties are now too. Oh, okay. I didn't so that was that was just like in the last uh, couple of years. Um, okay. Catherine Bringman and Connor Nazaroglu, um, okay. they found that you can complete them in a similar way to how you can complete a mock theta function. You can complete it to be something modular, and it works like okay. in space thesis actually. Oh, okay. Um, so I think they call this a framework for partial theta, but you can actually do stuff with it. Like you can actually. Uh, I know jo Josh is in the call. He's uh, in the chat. He, he's done a little bit with it, but you can actually like compute asymptotics of certain things with, with it using this modularity properties and stuff. Yeah, um, Ramanujan really... has a... Yeah, Rama, the one that I focus on in here, Ramanujan has a cool asymptotic of that people have studied because I went to start looking at it and then realized if any question I had had already been done. Oh, really? Okay. Um, yeah, there. It's like if you do, you like, it, you replace Q with like, I think it's one minus T over one plus T. And then you look at the expansion in T and you get oh. positive coefficients. And one there's an minus T over one plus T. I think that's what it is. I'm pretty sure the paper, yeah. this was one of, I'm pretty sure the paper was by Bruce. I'm pretty sure this was one of those situations it's where, um, I like started talking to him about something and then found a paper that he had written that he didn't really remember having written because he's written so many papers. 
And then, so if you have one minus t over one plus t, what do you let t tend to? You let t tend to, oh, maybe it's, wait, that doesn't make sense. Maybe it's one plus t over one minus t and you let t go to one, which then would make more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, it almost feels like a Cayley transform. Yeah, I was going to say, are you going inside? Like but, which is a way of renormalizing Taylor expansions around a point mm -hmm. inside the unit disk. Um, yeah, well, what paper? I'm, I'm interested. What paper? I, I yeah. can find it and send it to you. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I know I, I know it did not take me long to find it. Yeah. Once I, like, was looking I know at about it. growth rates of these things. Like, Zagie wrote down something very useful for this, too. He has a section in one of his papers, which is just called sums of the form f of nt. Um, but it's just a Mellon transform argument. And something, I think he wrote something about the Mellon transform in some appendix or some book for physicists, like to explain to physicists why the Mellon transform is interesting. But anyway, he writes down something like sums of the form f of nt. And it's a, it's a, all really easy arguments, but it's actually ideally suited, and that's his example of what he does um, for partial data functions. Um, but that's cool. Yeah, do you know which paper that is, Josh? You probably looked at this one, right? Katrin has all our people. Looked at it. I don't know. Zagier's paper. Um, um, but yeah, I'll definitely uh, be interested to see the paper of Bruce yeah. that you mentioned. Um, yeah, we we know really a lot more about how to study the the asymptotic properties of this because of the modularity. That's really something very new, and I'm not sure it's like yeah. widely known yet. So uh, yeah, I think even when I started studying this project, it was like really only motivated by the fact that Ramanujan had these five identities that looked really similar and that it would be really nice to have combinatorial proofs of them that actually highlighted that since their analytic proofs didn't. And like everything I yeah. read about false data functions was like, well, no one finds them interesting because mock data functions are cooler. <laughs> and then, and then more. Yeah. Well, it was something for like, more than 15 years people wanted to find and I know that for example Katrin believed this was like a really difficult problem and that it may not be possible and some and physicists had been trying because they had applications for it too so like this was a well-known problem to people in the area and um, Katrin and Conair basically found it kind of they weren't expecting to find it and they just kind of I don't know I think accidentally found that it, it works exactly the same the same way as in Spiker's thesis and it has as as rigorous of a structure. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure it's widely known yet or not. So it definitely, um, you should take a look. I think it's, they, they highlight a really specific example. I think unimodal sequences. Like, so they highlight okay. a combinatorial example and the application to it in the paper. Um, and they work it out mostly like for that example, so. Cool. All right. Uh, yeah, any, I guess, any other questions or comments? Sure. Uh, can you show me the uh, the list of identities that uh, uh, you put very, very here by Ramanujan? I'm just going to rush through it all. That's it. So you said yeah, you it's on. I don't, actually, I don't remember which um, volume of the, I think it's, I, I th it's either part one or part two of the series on the Lost Notebook. Mm -hmm. So all the parts of the Lost Notebook are, series are done now, right? Mm -hmm. are they the all last one I'm using to prop up my laptop <laughs> right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, the last one took a while because Bruce is very particular on wanting Ramanujan's proofs of everything. Right. And there was like there were a couple things that he like couldn't find. Yeah. So what how how does uh Bruce make the rules for what sorts of proofs that does it does he have does he it, it can only use the technology that Ramanujan would have known at the time, or does he even try to find I, that he thinks Ramanujan would have had? I think it's the thing he thinks Ramanujan would have had. I don't think there's a super well-defined, like, 
yeah. thing, but it's like, a, it, like, I think there's a lot of times where it's like, like those tools, like Bruce was just very confident Ramanujan wouldn't have been interested in and wouldn't have found, or, or had been like, there was too much that was developed later that he wouldn't have. Yeah, I know, um, well, Bruce has given a talk on like one of the ones that was that took the longest one of the identities that took the longest to prove he did something with mm -hmm. sock rescue right but that he yeah that was using more modern techniques and and was that one of the hard yeah. ones Ramon original? I think original? that might have been one of the hard ones yeah yeah I didn't I haven't had that many conversations with him about which specific ones I just I've overheard a lot of conversations where he was like I'm still trying to get this one and someone will be like well what about that paper and he's like no that's not Ramanujan's uh, yeah method yeah okay. uh any other uh questions or comments before i stop the recording